warm hello and welcome to this latest Science Custom podcast. My name is Sean Sanders and I'm the Director and Senior Editor for Custom Publishing at Science. Today I'm delighted to bring you a brand new podcast from Science Custom Solutions in which we'll be chatting with Dr. Jim Huggett from the University of Surrey and the National Measurement Laboratory at LGC in the UK where he's a Senior Lecturer in Analytical Microbiology. Jim's primary focus is how best to apply metrology, the science of measurement, to improve the accuracy and reproducibility of a broad range of molecular analyses used across science. In this interview, I'm going to be asking Jim specifically about digital PCR and how it is applied in environmental testing for pathogens, including bacteria and viruses. Our thanks to Stella for their kind sponsorship of this webinar. Stella Technologies is a Paris-based biotechnology company that focuses on accelerating the development of next-generation genetic tests by providing a groundbreaking and flexible digital PCR solution. Taking advantage of cutting-edge microfluidic innovations, Stella aims to make digital PCR a lab commodity in all life science areas. Jim, many thanks for agreeing to be interviewed today. Hi, Sean. It's great to be here. So, Jim, for those not familiar with the technique, can you briefly explain what digital PCR is and how it is currently being applied in the biosciences? So, yeah, if if one were to think of a, a PCR reaction, say particularly a quantitative PCR reaction, where you have primers um, and usually a probe um, to to provide a signal, uh, digital PCR uses very very similar chemistries. The fundamental difference between a qPCR and a digital PCR is that whereas a qPCR will occur as a single 20 microliter, for example, reaction, the digital PCR has a partitioning event. So that 20 microliters is broken into a number of smaller reactions, which we term partitions. And so consequently, each molecule gets its own um, partition to perform the experiment in. It's currently being applied in a wide range of biosciences um, from you know, uh, research into clinical measurements, things like cell-free nucleic acid, looking at rare variants. It's uh, used um, for quantification. There's, it has quite high accuracy when it comes to quantification. And also the national measurement community, um, like the National Measurement Laboratory in the United Kingdom, very interested in this technology because it has potentially unprecedented reproducibility when compared to other methods like qPCR and sequencing. So simply, it's much easier for you and I to get reproducible results. So what do you see as the particular strengths of digital PCR when compared to current and well-established quantitative PCR and next-gen sequencing methods? So if we split those two techniques and compare them individually, so first of all, the qPCR uh, is used world over. It's established for a variety of areas of um, research and, and application, routine applications. Digital allows certain aspects like um, the ability to measure rare variants. The digital PCR is able to find those um, rarer sequences because of this partitioning I mentioned earlier. And so it's much easier to find them, uh, whereas in a qPCR reaction, the uh, assays may pick up the wild type. It's a much reduced efficiency, but because the wild type sequence is predominant, it can, be, it can hide essentially the signal. Digital PCR is also potentially much more precise than qPCR, whereas a qPCR's precision to quantify the abundances is dependent on a number of things, including the efficiency of the experiment, which can vary with assays and also from from run to run. Digital precision is is determined by the random distribution of the molecules, and essentially it follows this um, very, very predictable distribution. And because it has a a higher precision, or it can measure a smaller difference than qPCR, it has potentially useful roles in measuring genome copy number instabilities, also perhaps in in things like cancer or, or looking at copy number variations elsewhere. The digital PCR also has the ability to measure um, linkage uh, in a way that is difficult for qPCR because the DNA molecules will partition. They will end up in different partitions in a generally a random distribution. However, when two molecules are linked in cis, such as in a haplotype or where you might have viral integration into a genome, those molecules will pair and they will occur together in the same partition. And so this can be used to predict where the molecules are linked. And then another area that's particularly of interest to uh, myself working in, in, in measurement research is this high reproducibility. When compared to sequencing, some of those, men- those advantages I mentioned, like rare variant detection, some of the sequencing strategies can also do that. And so potentially are of 
preference when looking at rare variants because you can measure more rare variants with sequencing. But the digital is, is conceptually much simpler to perform, whereas, you know, sequencing has advantages beyond, you know, huge, huge potential. Uh, there's algorithms involved in trying to analyze those sequences and, and, and you know the expertise and, and software that's needed for that and also the uh, the upstream steps to prepare um, the sequences for a sequencing run depending on what method you're looking at can also add complexity and um, and what we call measurement uncertainty when we're looking at measurements. What do you think might be some of the new or future applications or possible fields of application for digital PCR? So it largely depends, I guess, on how the methodology is developed. But I predict that, you know, as the technology is developed and advanced, um, this ability, this this ability to measure with potentially higher reproducibility, higher accuracy, will will mean that digital PCR becomes an increasing um, uh, advantage because it'll be easier for us to get more comparable results. The qPCR has a potential problem with its output, the, the um, quantification cycle or cycle threshold or crossing point, depending on who, who you are and what metric you use, in that it is, it is quite a precise measure, but it is highly arbitrary and can vary when the same person measures the same experiment. So this, this really causes issues with reproducibility of qPCR, which requires calibration. So I think this would be a major advantage as we go, go forward. An example would be perhaps in the use of PCR-based methods for near patient or point of care testing. It's much simpler for a less well-trained individual to look at whether um, a, a reaction has, has performed well or not. The, the digital output is, tends to be less ambiguous um, than a, a qPCR output that may be uh, not, not so clear, which, which is both beneficial potentially to less well-trained individuals, but also software algorithms. So, you know, I think, you know, that, that kind of automation will, will add, uh, add advantages when, when, we, when we look to the future. There seem to be a lot of molecular technologies that are moving towards multiplexing. So uh, regarding the current efforts to increase the number of detection channels in digital PCR systems to enable uh, target or assay multiplexing, how important do you see this development and what do you think is the optimal number of channels necessary to support today's multiplex studies? That's a good question. I get the answer is how long is a piece of string, we would say, in the UK? Uh -huh. um, it, it, it largely depends, I guess, on, on what the needs are of the individual laboratories and why they need multiplexing. So if we compare um, with qPCR, people will multiplex with qPCR and, and depending on the format can get very high multiplexing. Um, but to multiplex to end it is quite it's quite challenging from an optimization point of view. Um, we've certainly found that with digital, it's much easier to optimize multiplex um, uh, reactions. When it comes to increasing multiplex, the trick will be in the ability to and the software to al analyze them. So you know it, it's quite quite comparatively easy with digital PCR to look at a twoplex by eye and you can see what's going on. Well, as you get up to five or six, um, you know, um, fluorescent channels, then it, you cannot do that by eye. Well, I certainly couldn't do that by eye. So it, it depends on how the software algorithms are going to be able to analyze that. But I see no reason why why they wouldn't be able to. And so there's a lot of potential there. And again, why would, you know, when you compare that with sequencing, well, you know, your next generation sequencing is a completely different level of multiplexing. And, and um, I say this carefully, I don't see PCR-based strategies ever going to be able to compete with that from the point of view of the number of targets you can measure. But obviously, there may be automation, there may be cost benefits, there may be simplicities that the PCR-based strategies give you that the other methods don't, and which digital would be ideally positioned. But Jim, we're talking uh, towards the end of May 2020, and on everyone's mind is the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, how are scientists currently applying digital PCR to test for this virus? So there have been a number of publications um, which have looked at SARS-CoV-2 and, and how digital PCR may be applied and compared it with qPCR and have shown that it works better and it's more accurate. And I'm very wary of those those some of those publications because you will have a lab that's really carefully working with digital PCR, comparing with measurements that are being made with qPCR in an incredibly stressful time with labs that are under-resourced and, and just basically desperately trying to keep up. So I would be very cautious at the stage with regarding the fact that, you know, the digital PCR could be a better method for the diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2, which some are claiming, uh, for several reasons. The initial one really being in that the PCR is only able to measure the, the nucleic acid you get into the experiment. 
and the vast majority of the source of error is in the sampling of the specimen and the um, processing and extraction. And so consequently, the methods are comparable in that way. And I think one of the potential issues with many of the digital PCR methods is that they don't have the same effective reaction volume as a qPCR. So they, they can take a sensitivity hit because of physics. The method is, however, having a really useful role in supporting the accuracy of measurements. Now, I touched on this earlier, but the digital PCR has a potential to be, be highly accurate in a way that qPCR cannot be. Because for qPCR to be accurate, by which I mean to be quantifying the number of copies of RNA that are present with a level of accuracy, it needs to be calibrated. And this has been shown previously with other like viruses like influenza or, or respiratory syncytia virus. Um, and a recent study uh, out of INSTAND, the proficiency testing scheme based in Germany, has shown that um, over 460 labs um, evaluating SARS-CoV-2 materials, that the qPCR is um, wildly variable when quantified. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is currently not quantified. The presence of the viral RNA is considered uh, at the diagnostic level for someone being infected. But all of the criteria, the criteria underneath these measurements, and most of them are reverse transcription qPCR, are quantitative and they're being used at the moment to give ideas of limit of detection, to look at ranges of the, the methods and the output signal, the quantification cycle or CT that is used for qPCR is being used as this value that can be compared. This is a mistake because the, the CT value or CQ value is, is, is arbitrary and can vary within, well certainly the instant um, data shows without calibration it can vary by a factor of over 100,000 fold and even when it's calibrated without a harmonization, a global harmonization, like the, the type of thing that's provided by the WHO for things like HIV, it will vary by a thousandfold. The digital PCR performing in those comparisons is varying much smaller, with much smaller changes as tenfold is the, the worst case scenario we saw. And we predict that that is probably linked to the extraction step, because we know the digital PCR, the measurement of the RNA, has been characterized and is quite reproducible. And so we can, again, we can use that to evaluate the extraction and optimize the extraction step in a way you can't really with qPCR, because the qPCR, that CQ value or CT value, is contributing to the noise. And so you're, it, it's difficult to know whether it's the noise of the qPCR between laboratories. And bearing in mind that value will change with the, even within the same experiment being looked at by different people. So it has this ambiguity that makes it more difficult to, to look at the robustness of the methods. And so the digital PCR can be used to really drill down the performance of some of these pre-analytical steps, essentially supporting the application of qPCR, which is a very widely used and very, very useful diagnostic technique. We are going to have to end there. So Jim, thank you so much for being available to talk with me. I really appreciate you providing us with your insights into the important role that digital PCR plays in scientific research and biomedicine. Thank you, Sean. It's a great pleasure to be here and, and stay safe. And thank you to our listening audience as well as our kind sponsor, Stella. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please send an email to custompodcast at aaas.org. We'd love to hear your comments on this podcast or ideas for future ones. I'm Sean Sanders. Thank you so much for listening.